Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Art of Photography. My name is Ted Forbes and today we are going to continue on talking about some classic medium format cameras. And today I want to talk about a twin lens reflex camera known as the Flexoret. And the Flexoret were made in Czechoslovakia from about 1939 until probably the 70s or so. And I've had this one about 10 years. And at the time, about 10 years ago, I was shooting a lot of medium format work and I was working a lot with kind of classic TLRs. I was really kind of obsessed with them. Uh, there's something just kind of different and cool about them. They're very unusual by today's standards, especially in a digital world. And this one was particularly fascinating to me just because I didn't know much about it. And here's this kind of cool camera coming out of Eastern Europe, uh, you know, way before my time. And I wanted to see what it was all about. So I bought this one. And it, they are remarkably sharp cameras. The image quality on here is outstanding. Um, we're gonna break it down and talk about it in a second. You're gonna have to earn your shots because the build is a little strange on here and it's kind of overbuilt in some ways. But they are wonderful cameras uh, made by a company called Meopta and they are still around today. They kind of deal in high-end optics for medical application microscopes. They're I guess you could probably equate them to probably the Eastern European version of something like Carl Zeiss or maybe Nikon's higher applications or something like that, or maybe even Leica to that extent. Uh, but anyway, let's go over and let's break down and take a look at the Flexoret 7. Okay, so we're gonna have a look at the Flexoret and this particular model is the Flexoret 7. Um, they actually made seven models. This was the last one to be produced. Uh, the six and seven, I believe, were out at the same time and there's some subtle differences between the two, but the seven was really the culmination of all the years of camera design that went into this. You'll see this as we go through the camera, but I think one of the things that makes this, this particular model really interesting is when you consider the place in history and the point of time where it was designed and what was going on. And this was an era, you know, we're looking at roughly 20 years from, well, 30 years from the 40s up through the 60s into the early 70s. Um, really that golden age of the 50s and early 60s of where you have industrial manufacturing up to a point where you can do a lot of really nice stuff in terms of machining parts. And what I love about this is this is designed in that same era where there was still an emphasis on design and designers and a real pride and craft and quality that went into everything. I mean, this camera still works today. And, you know, you're looking at a camera that's, that's you know, 70 plus years old, potentially. Actually, this one is not quite that old. This is probably more in the 40 year old range. But anyway, my point is, is that, that, you know, things aren't built to last like that anymore. And I think that's what's particularly interesting about these. Now, if you are, have ever had any experience with twin lens cameras. Um, this one, I will be very honest, is overbuilt in a lot of ways, impressively so. Um, the body is supposedly made out of some kind of aluminum and it's still got a lot of heft to it. This is, this is a deadly camera if you were to throw this at somebody or drop it. Um, but basically, twin lens reflex cameras, if you're not familiar with how they work, there are two lenses. Um, there is what is known as the viewing lens on the top and there's what is known as the taking lens on the bottom. Now how this works, is when you flip the top up here, you're going to be able to get a preview. Now what we're doing here is we're seeing a mirror that is at an angle inside the camera body that is projecting what you're seeing in this top lens. There's no aperture adjustment on here, there's no shutter. It is perfectly synced up with the taking lens, so theoretically when you get in focus and you frame things up, everything that you're viewing is the same as what the camera is seeing when it takes it. Now this creates um, other issues that may or may not be corrected depending on what the camera you're using, like parallax, for instance, if you get close, um, what you're seeing needs to actually be a different height than where the taking lens is and, and whatnot. But anyway, um, that is essentially how the, the twin lens reflex camera works. So what we have here in the top, this is the viewer and uh, through the lens viewing there with that top lens. And much like the Pentacon 6 that I showed you last time, this viewer has a couple options on it. You have a magnifying glass that comes up like this, and this is hard to see and goes in so you can, you can get spot on focusing, um, which is kind of nice, a little janky to deal with. But as you you can see already this camera is going to slow you down quite a bit. Um, the other thing that's kind of nice is you can actually pop this up and if you use that in combination with this you can see there is just a little hole cut here for framing. So they call this the action finder on most of the old twin lens reflex. The roller flexes were like this and, and many of the others. And it was just simply a way if you have your settings together, if you're shooting in daylight you're not worried too much about focus and aperture as long as you're in the ballpark and you can use this to frame up shots and not have to look down through the viewing lens. Um, using a camera like this with a viewfinder, it's a really stealth way to take pictures because it doesn't always look like you're taking pictures. It looks like you're looking down into a box and uh, so it's a little it's kind of a stealth way to do street photos and there's a lot of photographers who like it for that advantage uh, but anyway that is how the um, the viewfinder works 
And real quickly, I'll give you a tour around the camera. In the back here, you have the little filter uh, chart here, and you have a way to set whatever the ISO is, just as a reminder. This doesn't physically, mechanically do anything inside the camera. There's a top button up here. When you push that in, this releases the back. It allows you to move that down, and this is how you load film into the camera. You're going to take the spool up down there, transfer it to the top, put your film in the bottom, and you're going to, to wind it across. Now, you're going to see already how solid this is built. There's a really wild looking roller here, which you can see actually has a smaller plane. All these flexorettes had adapters for 35 millimeter film, so you could actually shoot 35, 35 millimeter film inside a medium format camera. I don't have all the necessary stuff to do that with, um, mainly the winder up here, but it is kind of cool that they had that option. So there's a lot of um, you know ways that can be done on the camera. Um, on the side, there is a hot shoe. Um, there is, on the other side, we've got the, um, the frame counter, and then we have the winder here, which advances the film. Winding this camera and cocking the shutter are kind of two different things. What, to take a picture, what you do is you advance the film here by winding, and then down here, here, this is the shuttercock, so you're going to bring that up and back, and then you're ready to shoot, and you can simply push the button on the front, which will take the picture. There's also a uh, locking button there, and you do have a flash sync over on the side here. Now this is where the camera starts to get more complex. The focusing on here is actually really cool. It's all done with this lever down at the bottom here. So I can focus anywhere, and it's marked in feet and meters on here from just under three and a half feet. Uh, you can get macro adapters for this camera. And this goes all the way to infinity and everywhere in between. Now you can see when I'm, I don't know if you can hear this, when, I'm, when, I, when I move this lever, let's see if we can do it, there's some little stop points in here, and you can move through them, but you definitely feel a little solid stop in there at different places. What this does is this makes it a little faster to focus. So if you're shooting outdoors, you're using a smaller aperture so you have a greater depth of field, you can kind of ballpark your focus and get it in there. So all the way over here, you're at infinity. The first little stop is about 40, 35, 40 feet, somewhere in there. The next one is down to about mm, 10 feet. Then you're down to about six feet, and then you you know you're going to close focus up here. So that's kind of nice if you're kind of doing something where you need to make adjustments quickly. And so that's a really nice thing to have on this camera. So that is essentially how your focusing works on here. Now it gets even more complex here and impressively overbuilt and designed. Um, but the wonderfully deco-oriented um, front part here um, on the viewing sorry on the taking lens you have a series of levers on here. This little red one down here allows you to change. The the flash sync. Now this doesn't really work by today's standards anymore because we have kind of one kind of flash. But back in the old days we had flash bulbs. You would actually want to set it because they were so hot and so bright to where the shutter speed would actually go off slightly behind the flash bulb. And so it does have the older options for those. If you're ever going to use a flash with this you would not want to select that option. You want to have a modern flash sync. But these do uh, work with that. The other cool thing is the flash sync pretty much works because it's a leaf shutter. It just kind of opens and closes in a series of uh, aperture blades in there is kind of what it looks like uh, but the blades open and shut so it's not a curtain that moves and so you are able to achieve flash sync pretty much at all speeds which is really pretty cool um, the other thing down here all right so this this little lever here when you turn this this changes the shutter speed and the top shutter speed on the flex rate 7 is 500th of a second and then it goes clear down to an eighth of a second, fourth of a second, half a second, one second, and bulb on the lower end. And then, of course, you have your standard 30, 60, 125, 250, etc. going down the side. Now, on the other side, there's this little lever which pulls out. And you can see all these little teeth in the ring there. I don't know if that's really easy to see on here or not. But basically, you pull it out, and then it, it kind of sends it shoes itself back down into those teeth there. And so what this is doing is changing the aperture. Now the reason it's doing it with those teeth, this is really pretty cool. And a lot of the lens design and a lot of the shutter design that you see in the 1950s really follows this, this kind of schematic here. And so basically what it is, is you see a series of red numbers there. Those are the exposure guide numbers. So if you have a meter, you can look at the exposure guide number and let's say it's 16 and just move the, uh, you're going to have to figure it out so you can get this clear over to 16. But anyway, once that's set, then my shutter aperture combination moves together. Look at that because it's sitting in the little teeth there. So that is really pretty cool. So if, you're, if you want to take a different, couple different pictures and you know, adjust your aperture, your shutter speed accordingly, it is possible to do on here. It's almost like, uh, you know, if you're using program mode on a modern camera where you're able to just lock in your exposure and then move that combination around. And so that was really a pretty cool design. Um, 
you can feel it when you're using this camera and you know you're having to earn your shots <laughs> because uh, it's quite a bit to wind quite a bit to advance the you know there's just a little bit of resistance you, you kind of have to, to man up and handle the camera you know and and it, it's interesting I've always been a firm believer that you know as a photographer you need to be independent of your equipment in other words you're not looking to get lucky when you're taking pictures you're looking for the camera to do what you want it to do and so therefore even cameras like this that are more involved and more difficult to use you should understand how to good get a good picture with when i was shooting a lot of tlrs i kind of dedicated myself to this camera for a while as i kind of did with my roloflex and when you do that everything kind of becomes second nature and it actually is faster to use this camera than you would kind of initially think it's going to be but that is one point to make on this and you know, I think it's just, it's such a classic design era, um, not just for cameras, but for lots of things. You know, like I said, the, the advancements in machining and the emphasis on quality and design and pride of craftsmanship all kind of came together. And these are a lot like, you know, Swiss watches in that sense. It's an impressive design, it's impressive uh, machining of parts, and it just comes together to make this beautiful piece of, you know, I guess in the formal world you call it decorative arts, but, you know, even the deco kind of look to this and the fact that it's gray and you kind of have, you know this pattern back and sides on here and everything is really in good shape for a camera that's probably around 40 years old so anyway like i said there are other models of the flex rut this is the only one i've ever owned i'll talk about how you can find one in a second um, but you know the earlier models you know from the late 30s were like the one and the two and then of course they progressed and, and added more features and 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 more to the camera and they just got got more solid and better and i've really liked my seven quite a bit um, in the last episode on the pentacon six uh, people kind of uh, wished that i had showed some photos so look in the show notes and i will link up to a gallery of images that i've shot on the flex so you can kind of get a feel for the sharpness and the lens contrast and stuff like that so check out the show notes and uh, usually below this video and uh, you can you can link out and see some of the work that I've done on this camera so that is the Flexoret 7 and if you are interested in getting one of these cameras um, my only advice is be very careful they are used obviously they don't make them anymore and they're very old and you find them in all kinds of varying conditions i've actually seen these with lenses just literally like taped in there with scotch tape uh, this one it happens to be a pretty good sample of 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 the flexoret if you're interested in buying them i'm not a huge fan of ebay but unfortunately it kind of is the necessary evil because it is a great way to find stuff that you can't get new anymore around the world and there is a seller on ebay who i bought this and i actually bought my pentacon 6 through i believe um, there's a seller his name is kupog i think is how you pronounce it c-u-p-o-g i'll link his his uh, store page up in the show notes. He deals a lot in really obscure optics, uh, a lot of cameras. You'll find Flexorets, Pentacon 6, stuff like that. And I don't know if he actually himself is a repairman, but um, he does, you're gonna buy working cameras from him. They're very clean. Um, they're not the cheapest things you're gonna find out there, but they're a little more expensive. And personally, I think it's worth it if you find somebody you trust like that who is going to stand behind the quality on it. Um, this is actually a funny story. When I bought this camera from Kupog, I think is how you say it, um, it was about 10 years ago the one I got just like froze up I couldn't get anything to work on it and I just got it and I emailed him he said hey send it back no questions asked completely just replaced it with a new one for me or a new old one depending on how you want to look at that so anyway so that is the flexor at seven um, obviously there's six other models to look at as well and they're all kind of interesting in their own right and very collectible I think but um, you know not on the too high end of collectability and they do make wonderful pictures you're gonna earn your shots on here but they're well worth it um, I've taken some very sharp beautiful contrasted images on here and it's it's got a quality on it when they're in good shape that rivals something like a Hasselblad uh, just in terms of sharpness um, you're a little more stuck with features obviously because you have a fixed focal length lens there are no um, you know lens optical accessories that you can get short of filters and, and macro adjustments stuff like that but anyway um, the flexor is an amazing camera so check them out uh, if you have experience with the flexoret feel free to leave a comment and tell us about it in the comment section remember always to subscribe to the channel and once again I want to thank you guys for watching the art of photography we do this show the longer one every Sunday and uh, during the week we have some shorter episodes we do right now currently there are two other shows running so we do three shows a week so be sure to check those out and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more. Anyway, once again, guys, this has been The Art of Photography, and I'll see you guys next time. Later.